Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, members of the Hermanus History Society and visitors today. I'm on a Zoom call with our presenter, Sherry Garlic Stanton, author of The Accidental Entrepreneur, the story of John Garlic and the famous department store, where many of you may have shopped. Sherry is the great granddaughter of John Garlic. Today, you will hear more about this extraordinary story on the big screen where you are now or a Zoom link. Welcome to Sherry, addressing us all the way from northwest of San Francisco. May I say that I have so enjoyed your book, the enormous attention to detail. I learned much about Cape Town and the years that John Garlick spent in South Africa, 1872 to 1931. He was also to and fro to England on the ocean liners. I learned about his family, his vision. He brought bicycles and typewriter businesses into South Africa, had the first skyscraper built in Cape Town to name just a few. There's so many interesting historical nuggets in this book. And also finally, his generosity. So welcome, Sherry. We look forward to hearing about this wonderful book. Thank you, Angela. It's an honor for me to be here today or your afternoon and my morning. And I'm in the San Francisco area, as Angela said, northwest of the city of San Francisco. I really just thank you so much for inviting me to speak about my great grandfather and the book I've put together. And also, I'd like to mention my Hermanus connection too. But before that, I just want to also thank David Hilton Barber and his very talented designer, Anthony Curtin, for putting together uh, this very handsome volume. What inspired me to write this book? Well, I had written a, a story about my mother's parents and grandparents, and my father had died three months before I moved to California, and I found myself quite alone and wondered, oh gosh, where do I actually come from? I wanted to find out more but from my father and he had just died. So I went to his sister on a visit, return visit to Cape Town. I visited his sister and she had some wonderful memoirs that she had scribbled on in paper. She had them in her study and they just were lying loose. And I said, please, can I type them up into my computer? I'll give you back your notes and you'll have a computer version. I made it another little booklet for her with her notes. I met a lot of people I, I didn't know, and in my research on who these people were that she mentioned, I found myself at the University of Cape Town, where they have a, a collection of John Garlick's business papers called the Garlick Papers in their special collections library. I spent a day there with my cousin's wife, Meryl Garlick, and we poured through the wonderful folder of personal letters and papers and discovered a little bit about who this man was. But that all happened around 2003 and I really only started going back to John Garnick in 2014-13 but I did start a family tree. However, let me go back a little bit and talk about my connection to Hermanus. So in the early days, my grandparents had this home on the right-hand side, and it was a little Kwaivata, I think it was called. So it wasn't a direct road down to the Kwaivata we know. The house was off a little cul-de-sac, and to get to the tiny Kwaivata beach, we walked through a Feinbos path and wandered down across the cliff path and wandered down to the rocks and the little tiny beach and a nice tidal pool and had marvelous time as children. But in 1958, that house was burnt down and in that huge fire. So the few years later, my father bought this tiny cottage in Hermanus on Main Road, in the middle of the Main Road, past the golf course. And it was opposite De Hung. My parents loved fishing, but, and we loved Grotta Beach. So we'd go to Grotta Beach in the daytime in the mornings and the roving beach photographer would snap our pictures and post them up the next day at the cafe or outside the changing rooms we'd be able to order them and keep them as our souvenirs and memories and that's what happened here but during those years I think I was in my teens I started working at the local Hermanus prawn flats run by John Carstens it was a water skiing club 
my eldest sister, Gillian, and I took turns. She would work one day, I'd work the next day. And we did that for a couple of years. And then John Carstens moved over to Lagoon Farm and things changed. He, he carried on with his water skiing club, but he was more interested in his restaurant. So the big house up on the left-hand side was where he had his restaurant. It was called The Whistling Prawn. It didn't do all that well. After a couple of years, he got into financial problems and the property was up for liquidation auction. And he called my father and said, well, would he come to the auction and would he please stand as surety? But he had a backer. He assured my dad he wouldn't have to put up any money. However, that didn't really happen. The auction happened. John Carstens was the highest bidder and my father ended up being the owner of this property. And after a few more years of running at a loss, my mum just said, no, thanks. I'm going to live there. I really want to be living in this beautiful place. So she grew proteas and she also painted. And the photo on the right is a photo of her painting she did from a sunset picture of the lagoon. Where we, as now in my, our late teens and early 20s, enjoyed spending lots of holidays there. So that's my Hermanus connection, very strong memories and love for Hermanus. Before I carry on with John Garlic and the book, I just also wanted to mention that my grandparents, sitting in the middle row on the right-hand side, Jack and Linny Garlic, they had this farm on the left-hand side, Glen Ellie in Stellenbosch. It is now a very fancy wine estate. But then it was the sort of fruit farm and a wonderful place for us to go on Sundays for Sunday lunch. So in the back row of this photo on the right is John Garlic on the left of the back row. He is not the same John Garlic. He is the grandson of John Garlic. Unfortunately, a lot of people think that they know John Garlic and they probably do, but they probably knew this John Garlic and he was the grandson. He's the eldest son in the family. My aunt Ruth Jeffrey is in the middle of the back row and my dad is on the right hand side. Down below are the two youngest boys, Graham and Oswald. So moving on to John Garlic, I was very fortunate in having a lot of people help me with, show me their family albums and I was able to take their photographs, uh, phot photographs of photos. So these two, come from the Madge Garlic collection. Madge Garlic is my grandfather's sister. Um, the, and they're both photos of John Garlic as a youngster. He must have been around 16 on the, in the left-hand photo. He was training or he's doing his apprenticeship to become a draper in the town of Boston in Lincolnshire. He was born seven miles south of Boston in a small town called Algerkirk, but he did his apprenticeship in Boston photo on the right of him, he is, must have been taken shortly before he left for South Africa or when he arrived in the Cape Colony. So in both photos, you'll notice he has a little bokwaki. The ship he sailed on, this is the SS Marsden. It was built in 1870. It's probably one of its early voyages. It looks so tiny and frail in the big seas. And it is a, a sketch, so I think. So it's not exactly the real ship but it's something like that. He arrived at night after a 29 day journey. I'm not sure when they arrived at nighttime, if they were allowed to stay on board that night or get a lodgings. But the next morning, John Garlic would have walked up and down Adley Street and seen all little draper's stores. Perhaps he even knocked on doors and said, do you have a job? And he might well have met the Miller brothers then. They had their store up Strand Street. In those first few years that John Garlic was in Cape Town, he must have had a job with a mer merchant. And there are various theories, theories about this. I am not sure which merchant, but he would have traveled all over South Africa on his horse and cart, taking samples to the country stores to try and get sales ordered. I know that he made copious detailed notes of how you needed to go from A to B and which rivers you had to cross and where the ponts were and where, where, where to stay and where to camp and what hotels to stay. So these were all in the collection of at University of Cape Town that I discovered later, his detailed notes of travel.
my horse and cart. So the next slide is um, Strand Street store. I first came across this photo. It was, it was an invoice receipt. I was shocked to discover that he actually started not in Atley Street, but in Strand Street on the corner of Strand Street and Bree Street, way up there. So he wasn't really in the thick of things. You can see a little garlic name on the corner there. And later, this is an invoice dated 1883, but the transaction appears to have been about 1881. The following decade, Kerry is again. On the right hand side, you can see that he's there's a label, there's a sign, garlics, and underneath it says boot and shoe manufacturers. And in the middle of that road, it's a difficult to read, but it says millinery and costume rooms. And in the windows, you can see get J garlic draper and the upstairs windows. So he was obviously expanding. He, he made boots and shoes and there's letters to various people in England um, asking for different machines for his boots and shoes <laughs> to make them. I got to know a lot of language of boots and shoes. He entered competitions, he won prizes uh, for these boots and shoes. He also then had to expand and buy the adjoining building. So he owned the corner store, but he bought the next door properties. And the interesting thing about this store is that it had belonged, he bought it from Robert Miller, who was his future wife's uncle. So he must have made a good connection with the Miller brothers then. There were three in uh, the Cape Colony. Two had arrived, Robert and Alexander had arrived in the 1830s, and Charles Miller, his future father-in-law, arrived in 1857. I found this slide in Neil Garlick's collection. My aunt Ruth had told me to go and have a look at um, Neil Garlick's papers. He had a lot of family photos. And this one, you can barely make out the people, but in the middle of the bottom row, I think that must be John Garlick with a baby in his lap. But down on the left-hand side, he has written Constantia, Cape Colony or Sea Colony. And on the right-hand side, he has written Christmas 1881 J Garlick employees. So that's quite something that he has established already. I'm sure not all those people worked in his store because perhaps they were husband and wife and it was a family outing. He would take out his staff every Christmas on other occasions too. Yeah, I haven't really mentioned anything about his wife yet, but I mentioned her uncles, Robert and Alexander, and her father was Charles Miller. And they had the store where they all operated various tailor, hatter work, clothier shops in Cape Town, the two brothers, the two uncles. But they married in 1878. And John and Ellen had eight children. Their eldest son was a son called Charlie. And then there were the three daughters that followed. That's Elsie, Winnie and Madge in the photos. And then the boys are Charlie on the left, Jack is next, he, my, my grandfather with the dimples. Don is the next one in the middle, and then Archie and Roy. Archie joined the Royal Navy in England when he was 14, so early 1900s. Charlie, Don and Roy all worked in the store. And of course, Jack, my grandfather, was the farmer. Jack was born John Garlic, but they called him Jack. So going back to the Neil Garlic collection, what he had there were these four letter books uh, or amongst a lot of his papers and newspaper cuttings and a family tree that he had drawn. He also had these four letter books and the letter books were John Garlic's original handwriting, John Garlic's original letters to his agents and to his family and to his wholesale clients. Each book contained 1,000 pages. He had four of these letter books and I took photographs of all the pages. It took me a while and then I transcribed them. I read every one and whatever was interesting. I mostly trans tried to transcribe the whole letter, but sometimes I would just take, take out the highlights. It was a long and arduous process, but really worthwhile because there was so much of interest in those letter books. They dated from 1902 to 1905, so a lot of history there.
Yeah, I'm very grateful to Neil Garlick. He was a wonderful uh, connection for me. I used to visit him. We'd sit and chat in his chart farm up in Weinberg. Uh, he'd remember his life and work at Garlick's and tell me stories. He died in 2011, and it was then time for me to move on. I really missed him, missed our, our easy chat. I had to really start thinking about what research I was going to do in earnest. So the next thing I did, back to the garlic papers, this huge collection that turned out there were many, many boxes and there are today, uh, well, I don't know what's left, but there were 102 boxes when I last was in Cape, in Cape Town. Over the period that I researched at, at the University of Cape Town, I came across all these letterheads and realized, gosh, the most important thing for John Garlick was actually not his retail store, but it was, he was a wholesaler and he had branches in all these different towns in South Africa. There was Garlick's of Potchestrom, there was Garlick and Holcroft in Johannesburg, there was a Garlick's and Hans in Durban, there was a Garlick and Fortune in Bulawayo, and starting off in Bulawayo is a, is a huge story in itself. And then he also had a furniture store. He had independent wholesale clients. So for instance, John Orr was one of his main wholesale clients. Williams Franklin in Cape Town. He also got all his merchandise from John Garlic. And the reason John Garlic became a wholesaler, I think is because in those days, you had to appoint someone, an agent, to be your connection to a London buyer. And he probably thought he could do it better himself. So he established a buyer in London and had a long relationship with them. In fact, even after he died, Garlick's continued to get their merchandise through Hollingsworth and Matthews. The little two little red dots there are for his typewriter company, the Remington typewriter company. I wanted to show you the store he built on Adley Street. The Strand Street store, even though he bought three additional properties, it became much too small for his business. So he wanted to have a bigger retail store on Adley Street. And this is what he uh, had designed by Charles Freeman. It was very modern. It had lifts and a water sprinkler in case of fire, electric lights for those days in 1893. It opened in, in August that year. But already just Soon after opening, he was already planning his next store. And this is one on the right is a plan by John Parker. He got together with John Parker, their letters in 1902 to John Parker. I really want to build a skyscraper, he said. And so this is what John Parker designed. It had a steel frame and this building still stands today. But recently I was sent this photo from a publication called the Draper's Record. It shows both the stores together, and it's the first I've ever seen the two stores from this perspective. So I was very excited to have this sent to me by a friend who was doing research of department stores in the UK. There you can see Garlic's wholesale. He built it especially for his wholesale. Lower floors were for his retail offices and at the top. He also loved to encourage people to come in to take in the view of Cape Town from the top of both his stores. First, the 1893 store, there were advertisements saying, come and see the view. And then the garlic's wholesale, you could get to the very top to look around on the first skyscraper in Cape Town. Many are followed afterwards, but that was the first. It backs on to St. George's Street. So that was quite a find. It only came to me three months ago, this photo. So the research never ends. Another of his wholesale ventures was he created two other companies, the Garlic Cycle Supply and the Remington Typewriter Agency. He took up the sole agency for Remington Typewriters and that lasted until the 1930s when the Remington Typewriter Agency became Garlic's office equipment and later that then became Garlic's office machines more in my time. The cycle supply, he was importing bicycles from the late 1880s. I love this advertisement for the Waverley electric car. When he started importing cars, he had to change the name to Garlic's motor and cycle supply. But the electric vehicle, it is easy to operate. It's clean, it's safe. 
It's graceful, it's noiseless, it's simple, odorless, and a woman can run it. <laughs> well, not only did he then have these two companies to oversee, and although he had really good managers, he did make sure that they were all doing what he wanted them to do. He then also said, I haven't got enough in my hands, I need more to do, and he he decided to stand in 1891 for the city council Cape Town. He was elected that year and he served for over a 10 year period. Two of those years he took off and spent in England with his children and his wife because they were at boarding school and he wanted to make sure the parents were close by. But in 1902 there was a vacant seat going for the legislative council in the Cape Parliament that he stood for, he got in, but the next year he didn't get re-elected, so he stood for the House of Assembly. And there he is with the others who stood with him in the ticket of five, that's Cartwright on the bottom left, John Garlick is in the middle because he got the most votes, so he was the senior member of that group. And then William Jagger, who's a very good friend of his on the right-hand side, up at the back, Mr. William Thorne, and I don't know the fellow on the right, Anderson, I didn't find out much information about him. But so that is his political career. He got elected to the Jamison Parliament from 1904 to 1908. He didn't stand for re-election. I think by then, 1908, he realized he, politics wasn't what he really wanted to concentrate on. It took away too much of his time from his other duties. And he had started having these really strange symptoms, like cramping of his hands. He had written a letter to his uh, close friend, Thomas Micklin, to say that he'd been having trouble with his hands and his difficulty in walking. Sometimes he would find he, he shuffled along. So that was the beginning of the Parkinson's disease. He didn't realize that at the time. He didn't get an official diagnosis until 1913. But from then onwards, 1908, he concentrated on the shipping charges and he was a member of the Harbour Board. He would meet there and make sure that the Union Castle and Saline did not overcharge them for their shipping, their merchandise. It was always a problem with them. But Thomas Micklem was a dear friend of his. He helped him with his political campaigning in, St in the Stellenbosch district. They both became members of the Cape Colony Agricultural Society and met at various meetings. John Garlick had married into this very wealthy family and the property they he moved into was huge. It ran from Somerset Road all the way up Signal Hill and between Varney's Road and New York. It crossed over High Level Road, which wasn't there at the time in these early days. So he did a lot of experimenting. He'd import seeds and plants and a lot of strawberry plants and he'd promote um, various cuttings and plants and send them off to his friends and colleagues. Thomas Micklem was one of these beneficiaries of Garlic's kindness in those days. He also took on Jack Garlic, my grandfather, as a trainee on his farm and he taught Jack Garlic, everything he knew about fruit farming. But Thomas Micklem also had a winery on his farm, which was called the Stellenbosch Winery. I had wondered if it was the precursor to Stellenbosch Farmer's Winery, but I don't think it was. This was early 1904 period, and he sold wine and wholesale and whatever. John Garlic ran some advertising in his catalogues. All the stores then would produce catalogues and Garlic had realized that if he added advertising material to his catalog, the postage would be cheaper. So he encouraged Micklem to have an advertisement for his wines. And a month after the catalog appeared, Micklem wrote and said, gosh, this has been really that's such a good response. My wine sales have gone up fourfold. We're getting now to the last years of John Garlic's era in Cape Town. He's suffering a bit, he has terrible indigestion, his writing is cramped, his hands are cramping, he can't walk so well. And then his dear friend Thomas Micklem dies of TB in 1912 
and Thomas Mickland's wife follows him the following year, 1913. And then John Garlick's wife died in 1914. And the year before that, 1913, John and Ellen had gone to England for quite a while to consult specialists there. Ellen had some operations, but she had inoperable cancer. John Garlick went to Harley Street to ask about his strange symptoms, and it turned out that he had what was diagnosed as then as paralysis agitans. It's what Parkinson's disease was called then. So a lot of John Garlick's dear employees, colleagues died over the next several years. Although he was really suffering with his Parkinson's disease, he still maintained control over his business wouldn't hand over the reins to his eldest son, Charlie, until 1930. But there was a lot of loss in those years. 1931 arrives, and my story, and John Garlick died on the 11th of June. That was two days ago, 91 years ago, on last Saturday. So I did remember him well on Saturday. He's been a huge part of my life. He had this memorial built. It's in the Maitland Cemetery. That was a photo in Neil Garlick's collection, of, and I had my a friend colorize it for me. The memorial must have been built when Ellen died, and he was buried there too. Neil Garlick and I went to have a look and see what, what the state was in 2008, and we discovered it was in a terrible state. So we came back with his daughter, Margaret, and it's Margaret in the photo, and two of his farm workers from Chart Farm, and we cleared out the mess behind the memorial where the homeless people had been sleeping and cut back the vegetation and tidied up the front area that was very overgrown. Before I end, I just wanted to mention the homes that John Garlick had. He didn't have ever a home in Hermanus. He didn't mention the name Hermanus in all the papers that I came across, but three of his children established holiday homes there was Charlie, whose descendants are living there now, I think, and Madge, and my grandfather Jack. And also the children of those descendants are living, many of them are living in Hermanus right now. So it's quite exciting to think of the Hermanus connection to John Garlick. But these are the two homes. The Thorny Bray was in Greenpoint. It was originally called Hudde Verwachten when Alexander Miller bought it, Ellen's Garlick's uncle. Her father bought the property from Alexander Miller's estate when he died in 1864. And Barclay House was a little property that John Garlick bought. It was in his wife's name. It was next door to Barclay Cottage, which today is Rhodes Cottage, is very well known. And I'm sure possibly John Garlick was living there or was there when Rhodes died in Barclay Cottage next door in 1902 because they bought this house in 1895. Now, Barclay House was on a huge property. So this is on the right-hand side. Barclay House is on the right-hand side of the property. And on the left-hand side of the property, after his wife died, John Garlick built his very famous Waters Gate. I think most of you will remember it as Graceland. This is a photo I took in 2014, 100 years after they began building it. The plans were drawn up by there, and all the plans were in the University of Cape Town um, papers. They all called it Waters Gate, but somehow there's a sign on a little gate on the left-hand side of the property that says Water Gate. So at some stage, perhaps after it was sold, eventually the name changed to Water Gate. But I do prefer to refer to it as Waters Gate. Before I end off, no Angelus mentioned his philanthropy, he was very, very kind. He made so many small gifts and many large gifts. And some of the early beneficiaries, it's a thousand pounds each to Somerset Hospital and to the South African College. That was the precursor to the University of Cape Town. During the Boer War, he gave to all those different organizations. And every year at Christmas time, he'd send off five pounds to five churches in Lincolnshire, where he was in the little villages near where he was born, and his own village. But later, many other gifts came with conditions, one of which I'd like to recount, and it was the offer of £100 to the St George's Cathedral, but on condition that they cleaned up their 
property because it was in a terrible state. We suggested various shrubs to plant and to remove the dreadful hedge and the fence and to make it look a little bit more presentable. Of course, the St. George's Cathedral was not impressed with this and they turned him down. But six months later, he was successful in persuading them to take the hundred pounds. If he was to give it to the city council, would St. George's Cathedral then consider having the city council see to the repairs to the grounds? And of course, he told the city council exactly what to do and what shrubs to plant. And that's how St. George's Cathedral eventually became cleaned up. There's a huge gift he made to the city council again. He offered them 25,000 pounds. This also came with a condition because the city council had to come up with the same amount and 50,000 pounds then had to be matched by the South African government in order to build a sanatorium. Nilsport was the chosen place and Neil Garlick and I went to visit. We were walking into the main administration building and came across this lovely bust of John Garlick. It says, John Garlick of Cape Town, whose munificence enabled this institution to be established. It was quite a moment for me to see this. Of course, there's no TB patients there any longer, but we did enjoy being taken around and there are some patients there. It's a huge establishment, so it's not all being used at the moment. I hope something happens with it because it's a wonderful farm. The patients used to go to their own farming. His last big gift was to the University of Cape Town, it was 20,000 pounds. That was not conditional, but the University of Cape Town did offer him to choose a chair. And he said, yes, he'd like to take on the chair of commerce. So there was the John Garnick chair of commerce was established at the University of Cape Town, I think in 1924. Before I absolutely end off, maybe you have time to read a couple of these quotes. The one that struck me because of the Jagger Library fire was that the one at the bottom, it says, every time an old man dies in Africa, it is as, as if a library has burnt down, which is quite painful to think of. I think the garlic papers at the University of Cape Town did not burn, but they were a bit water damaged. And I'm not sure how those old papers are going to survive that, whether they'll be smudged. But the University of Cape Town is doing a lot to preserve the water damaged papers. Well, thank you, Angela. Thank you to the Hermanus History Society. I, 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 John Garley covered so many areas. It's very difficult to cut it down. I hope I've given you a vague sense of what it was like to have lived in those days. So that's the end, really. I thank you so much for listening. I really appreciate that. And I would love to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Sherry, anybody would like to ask questions? Hello, Sherry. Um, I'd just like to tell you, I lived uh, opposite the road from uh, Jewel Doddington and Gran Garlic. Now, was Gran Garlic your aunt or your mom? It's Graham Garlic you're talking about. Graham, he was my uncle. And Jewel Doddington, well, I showed you the photo of the five boys. The one on the right was Roy Garlick and his youngest daughter, youngest child was Jill Doddington, Gillian Garlick. My sister was also called Gillian Garlick. It was very confusing, but they were a different oh, right. generation. So Jill Doddington was actually my father's cousin. So she's my second cousin once removed. Um, we keep in contact and she was very helpful doing my research. She gave me lots of papers and she had the Winnie Garlick collection of papers. Oh, so, wonderful. My children called her Oma Knoffel. Oma <laughs> yeah, quite. <laughs> because they were Afrikaans. <laughs> yeah, my... Anybody else? A question here. When was the current building in Cape Town built? It looks like an Art Deco building. That's the 1904 building. I should explain. The 1893 building was replaced by the, in 1954 with a mod more modern store. And those two buildings were combined. So that photo I showed of the Draper's record, two stores together, that was 1905. In the 1950s, that was all changed to the more formal building. But the backside is still the original steel frame building that was built in 1904. Who was the architect of Watergate? William Hood Grant. There were lots of Williams in those days and lots of Johns. Sherry, 
as you know, I've read the book cover to cover and I've loved it. And there's just so much wonderful detail. And I, I feel I'm going to have a move around Cape Town and discover all these places. But also what you transmitted to us, and many of us dream of writing stories, either about our, our own lives or about our family's lives, but it was your journey too, and you conveyed that so beautifully. The story of John Garlic, which gosh, is very impressive, but it was your journey too, and I found that combination very stimulating. Every chapter, incidentally, has a relevant quote at the start, and I found that really inspiring. But because I've lived in Africa for a lot of my childhood, and because I've been on those Union Castle lines, I got a real sense of that family's movement between Cape Town and London and back again. It was so quintessentially, well, I felt English, and you have some recollection of that. In addition to that, there was the First World War and the Boer War, and all of that is incorporated in these pages. You learn so much. So Sherry, thank you so much. I found your talk very stimulating too. Thank you all the way from the United States. Thank you. Oh, what a pleasure. Thank you again for inviting me to speak about this amazing man and my journey. And Angela, you had mentioned the Robben Island thing, and it was one of the things I didn't cover, but I know you were interested to know about it, because when my cousin's wife, Meryl Garlick, and I were paging through those first papers in 2003, we came across this letter to the colonial secretary asking, John Garlick, writing to the colonial secretary, asking, please, can you admit my mother to the Robben Island Lunatic Asylum, which was such a shock, such a shock then. And then to realize when I actually learned further that she was suffering from depression and they'd had no way of dealing with depression in those days. And mm -hmm. so it was very sad to learn about his mother. And she actually died eventually in Johannesburg because John Garlick's sister also came to Cape Town and, and then she settled in Johannesburg. And the mother gravitated between the two homes and the lunatic asylums because she went from Robben Island to the Natal lunatic asylum. Thank you for mentioning that. It's just a lot, a lot to cover. <laughs> oh, there's a lot to cover. And of course, we all know about our leper colony in the Hemelade Valley and we've got a site visit there in, in a month or two. Yes. Uh, okay. But then the lepers went to Robben Islands. We gobsmacked to learn that there was also a psychiatric facility. One learns quite a lot about Parkinson's and the history of Parkinson's and the doctors that got involved and what they yeah. did and what they didn't do. Yeah. These are just extra nuggets. Thank you so much, Sherry. Thank Pleasure. you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.